Steve Moran here with another episode of Foresight TV. I am really pumped up to have Jeff Fisher with uh, MBK Senior Living, Southern California uh, based organization. And we are going to jump right into our conversation. But first, this. Hey guys, Steve Moran here. Well, Jeff, welcome. Thank I, you. I, we actually met in person sort of just barely just a few weeks ago in Palm Springs at the Senior Living Innovation Forum. And I'm really excited to have a conversation uh, with you about MBK and what you're doing. Let's actually just start first and talk a little bit about MPK, where you're based, where your communities are, how many communities. And oh, look at that. Here come the comments already for your team. But that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so let's let's hear a little bit about MPGA to start with. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invite. So MBK Senior Living, uh, we are a uh, senior living uh, operator manager um, in based in senior, uh, I'm sorry, based in SoCal uh, in Irvine, California. We have 32 communities presently uh, spread out over six western states. So basically from Colorado West. And we're actually getting ready to take on a new acquisition and a new management contract over the next couple of weeks. So we'll be up to 34 communities here soon. Terrific. So um, let's actually start. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort, sort of, well, actually, let's, I'm going to shift gears. Talk to me a little bit about kind of how you see what makes MBK special. I think first and foremost, it's our culture. We spend a lot of time and effort uh, making sure that our team members are heard, that we listen to what they have to say, what their what their thoughts, what their feelings are about what we're doing, about what's happening in the industry. And so we put a lot of focus on that culture and integration as, as we bring in new team members, whether it's hiring new team members to existing communities or as we're onboarding uh, new communities as we acquire and, and take on new management contracts. Um, and then I think the, the fact, part of the culture as well, listening to their ideas and, and, and um, integrating new ideas, changing th some of the things that we do as time goes on based on the input of our team members. Um, so we're just, we're always looking to how do we improve, how do we make things better, not only for our communities, our residents, but uh, for our team members to make their lives easier as well. I'd actually like to dig into that a little bit. Um, I, I, I have found that most of the time when I talk to senior living leaders and sort of ask them this question about listening to and really engaging with their team members that they all say they do it um, and they mostly don't. All the evidence I see, I want to start by saying that I don't see that as you. I mean, all the evidence I see is that you got you are actually one of the organizations that 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 that, that really makes you makes you special in doing that. Can you go maybe a little bit of a deeper dive into kind of how you make that happen operationally? Well, I think it's spending time with our team members. We invest that time. We, we go out to our communities. I have a, a relatively small executive team uh, and, a, and a regional national teams. And we, we do require our team members to get out into their communities on a routine basis. Uh, we want them in and out very frequently. So they're, in essence, seeing, touching, tasting the communities and, and knowing what's going on. Uh, and then myself and my executive team, we get out to the communities as much as possible. We interact with our team members. Uh, and if we can't get out, we'll make random phone calls just to touch base, Not, you know, for no specific reason, but just call and check in on folks, whether they're new and, you know, they're 30 days or 90 days in to check on them or even some of our long tenure team members, if they've had something happen or even if we're just seeing some numbers move and it looks things are looking good, we'll just call and touch base with them and and give the accolades where it's due. And, and then we'll brainstorm on challenges that are happening out there, too. So I think it's that. It's that personal touch level. And I think just being involved at the regional community level is important for us. Cool. So how have you how, how have you guys done during the pandemic? You know, like any other operator, I think we've certainly had our challenges. Um, you know, we, we lost our fair share of, of occupancy you know, throughout the 15, 18 months of the, the, the height of the pandemic. Um, but we put a lot of you know, it was, a, it was a good learning process for us. We learned 
um, you know, how to adapt to what, what needed to be happening during the pandemic. We, we put a lot of protocols in place like everybody else, but we also learned that we had to figure out how to engage our residents, you know, if they're isolated in their rooms, how to provide meals from, you know, a, a different approach than just, you know, the group dining and things like that. So um, I also learned that there's a lot of resiliency and a lot of camaraderie amongst the industry leaders. You know, we all, we all um, pulled together to make large purchases of PPE early on and things such as that. So I think it showed, you know, that even though we compete against a lot of others, we also work together to make good things happen when we have to. Um, and then, you know, throughout the pandemic, you know, we worked hard, especially, you know, from our operations and the sales and marketing perspective, um, we, we stayed focused on the task at hand. We didn't take our sales directors and lay them off and say, well, we can't do move in. So we're, we're just going to put you guys to the side or have you do other things at this point. We stayed focused on our sales efforts throughout the pandemic. We really stayed, um, front and center with our prospects to provide educational opportunities for them to learn about, you know, what is happening, what's going on with the pandemic. What does this mean to you? What does it mean to your loved one? If, if you need to have somebody move in right now. Uh, we found creative ways to keep front and center with our prospects and their families. And, um, and I think that's helped us as we are in the recovery phase now. Um, we certainly have our, a long road ahead of us as well, but we've recovered the greatest majority of what we lost um, over that th you know, year to 15 months. In, in the first six to seven months of our um, fiscal year, we've we, we have recovered most of that already. So what are some of the long-term lessons you've learned out of the pandemic that'll forever change how you, how you do sales and marketing, how you do programming, um, how you lead? Well, big changes in all those areas for certain. We, um, we certainly learned that we have to figure out ways or we had figured out ways and we will continue to do that to engage our residents. Um, you know, engage them during the, the sales process as, as their inquiries and then engage them once they're living with us and figure out creative ways to to bring programming to them. Technology plays a huge role in that as well. We are in the midst of piloting several different um, technologies to, to bring different aspects into community uh, to resident engagement, to, to communications, things such as that. Um, but I think these things will never go away. And, you know, we've we dealt with you know smaller isolations when we had norovirus or the flu bug would go through your building, and we did you know you just kind of rolled with that in the past. But now I think as we face those things, maybe they're much smaller than what the pandemic has brought. But I think it's brought us good lessons that we can still engage those residents, even if it's a small number of residents, and even if they're only isolated for two or three days. Hopefully, um, we can still engage with them and keep them active and keep them um, not only social but uh, mentally healthy as well. Yeah. I, cer I certainly know that that uh, for most senior living communities, maybe all senior living communities, that 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 last year there really wasn't a flu season because of the the precautions and and it's kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? So you wonder, uh, you know, we just uh, the industry has always accepted that there was this flu season and that we were going to lose residents because of the flu. And we, that didn't really happen. I mean, we did lose residents because of the um, uh, of the of the the, the um, uh, coronavirus. But I'm just wondering the COVID virus. I'm, and I'm just wondering how we, you know, what we will do going forward with that. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I think lessons we've learned over the past year and a half or so will we'll carry forward, and, and whether it's some sort of, you know, um, hopefully we don't have another pandemic like this ever in our lifetime. It's just yes. in, you know, in, incredible to deal with. But even if it is a smaller type issue as norovirus or something along those lines, again, lessons learned that we can still do a better job of engaging our residents, do a better job of caring for our team members along the way, and just making sure that things stay on track when we have those little uh, upheavals. So can you talk a little bit more about where you see technology playing in this, maybe even what kinds of technologies you're exploring and thinking about? Sure. Well, you know, again, I, I personally believe that, that our industry is consistently kind of behind the times from a technology standpoint. And so we, we have to get geared up and figure out ways to better um, utilize technology, whether it's, again, resident engagement platforms, whether it's, um, creative outreach to our sales prospects, whatever it might be. 
you know, like you said, we're piloting a few things. We are piloting a major um, resident engagement platform to improve communications with our residents and for them to their families, especially if they can't visit them for whatever reason. Um, we're piloting a new EHR system to be more robust and again, offer better communication capabilities, um, hopefully bring more automation to the care that we're providing. So it takes away some of the paperwork. I think, you know, historically this industry has been very manually based and very paperwork based. And I think the best we can do, the, the more we can do to, to streamline some of that and make it more electronic to where caregivers can get away from some of the paperwork and we can put more focused time energy on actually spending that time with the residents. That's what's most important. So at, at the Senior Living Innovation Forum um, here a couple of weeks ago in Palm Springs, uh, Bob Bob Kramer kicked us off, off the uh, conversation with a, a fairly blunt assessment that if I can distill it down, that senior living, from his perspective, senior living as it, it exists today isn't good enough. Um, and then we had a panel that followed that and Scott, uh, Scott Stewart at, at Capital Senior Living pushed back pretty hard saying, you know, I think it's actually pretty good. And uh, we will actually have Scott on as a, a guest sometime in the next few weeks or months to, to talk more about that. But when you look at the senior living uh, space going for, do you have sort of a big picture of what do you think it'll look like? Um, what, what's your big dream? <laughs> Well, you know, that's a great question. I think, um, I think by and large, we do an excellent job in, in the care we provide and services we, we offer to our, our residents and their families. But I, I do think we can do better. And, and obviously, as we transition into more of the baby boomers being our target audience, so to speak, as residents, not family members, then I think those the offerings are going to have to change. And, and, you know, a lot of things that have been probably talked about a million times, but you know, different dining offerings, you know, having, you know, rather than just one main dining room that everybody, you know, uh, congregates in, like, like we typically do in our industry, I think having multiple dining options, having more flexibility, you know, those grab and go, those, you know, pizza kitchens and things like that, that, that are just popular with, with, you know, the folks that we work with and, and even ourselves, you know, we go out to restaurants and, and enjoy different venues and such. So, I think having those types of offerings is going to be crucial. Um, obviously, I think it's going to be a much more focused population on health and uh, fitness. And so bringing a lot of uh, variety to those fitness programs. I think we have to absolutely get away from chair, you know, ch chair aerobics or chair yoga. And we have to bring that indoor outdoor space to where people can enjoy the outdoors, uh, where they can enjoy all sorts of different fitness classes. Tai Chi, whatever it might be, I think it's going to be critical to, to the customer we'll be serving in the coming years. Um, you know, the demographics are, are favorable for us, thankfully. Um, and I think the future is bright for senior living, but we do have to adapt and we do have to make things better. So I, I, from my perspective, as I look at the industry and I talk to owners and operators and people who are living inside the industry, um, you know, obviously, occupancy is a big issue, but we're seeing a number of, of organizations that are back to or close to back to pre-pandemic levels. We're seeing a few people and certainly some buildings that are that are higher than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, the thing that seems to be sort of just like the, the big, hairy, audacious monster that's coming into the industry that is really the labor cost. And um, what do we get thoughts about, you know, because what that suggests is that we're going to see rate increases I mean, at some point in time. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were talking about how, you know, at, at In-N-Out Burger, they're making in this particular marketplace $22 to $23 an hour. And that makes it pretty tough in senior living. Oh, absolutely. Every... Conference I've been to recently, every conversation I'm in, you know, labor dominates those conversations and, and it's not going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, costs are rising. You know, we we have had to raise our wages in, in virtually all of our communities, um, you know, whether it's a dollar, three dollars an hour, whatever it might be, depending on the market. Um, you know, agency costs are, are up significantly. Overtime is up significantly. There's just not enough people in the workforce. There's, you know, we've always been challenged to find quality in senior living and the type of, you know, you know uh, 
team members that, that have the heart for what we do. But now, you know, more challenged than ever. You know, there's just not enough people in the workforce, period. And then like you alluded to with, with in and out you can drive up and down the street and virtually every business out there is advertising for help and they're advertising starting wages and sign on bonuses and all these different types of things to attract new team members. And we're, we're right there with them. So we, you know, we're fighting and scratching for every single team member we can get our hands on, but we also still have to hire for heart and we have to hire, you know, this isn't flipping burgers, you know, nothing against those other industries, but of this course. is the yeah. for people. And we have to make sure we find people that have the heart to do what we do and that they're they're people oriented and service oriented. So um, we have to get creative in our recruitment efforts. We have to continue to look at how we stay competitive with wages and other benefits. And and then too, we have to figure out how do we balance that with the you know the resident rates and things like that. Um, I've talked to a lot of different people in the industry, and I've heard many that are talking significant you know high, significantly higher um rate increases for residents this year we're still trying to keep it fairly modest but we have to balance that with um with what's going on from an expense perspective so do you see any opportunities to i don't know use technology to reduce labor costs or I, you know I'm, just, I'm sort of just spitballing right now or or maybe even asking residents to do some work like i don't know manning the front desk or something like that that would that would make it make it keep the cost down. I, I don't know. Well, you know, there's a couple of things on that. I think number one, um, there's a lot of discussion about affordable senior living and how do we create a product line, so to speak, that will, um, you know, af afford many more seniors to, to be able to live in our type of setting. You know, figuring out what does that look like from a, again a cost perspective and a service offerings, if you will. Because again, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a much lower cost, you have to figure out what you know. You're gonna have to in some way reduce that service offering, whether it's you know one meal a day versus three, or or some scaled down activities, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I, I think technology does play a role um, to a degree. Uh, the more we can you know implement you know, the use of Uber and some other things, maybe it takes away from, you know, some of our traditional transportation and that might help the cause. Um, but it, it, at the same time, I can't ever see me personally, I can't see robots, you know, doing showers or, you know, yep. those types of things, you know, the hands-on resident care. Now, maybe they can help with resident, I'm sorry, with the meal delivery and things like that. So maybe there's some sort of balance there, but again, it's, it's a, it's a human business and we're always going to have that factor where we have to balance those costs because we're not going to just, you know, you know, completely automate a community. So one of the things that that's occurred to me, and I've actually shot a little video rant that will turn into an article here in the next few weeks. But when I look at any given marketplace, so, um, uh, you know, I live here in Sacramento and within a, say a five or seven mile radius, there are about, 14 uh, senior living communities. And I, I know generally two things that they're all struggling to find enough staff. But on the flip side, they all seem to have, they all have some staff, right? Because they're, they're continuing to operate. And it would suggest that, um, that from, a, from a, a worker standpoint, that one community is sort of about the same as another, meaning that if I can get 50 cents an hour, a buck an hour, I'd go one place, which means that nobody really dominates the marketplace. Do you have any thoughts about how you might, I mean, to, so to me, the, the thinking is that there's this really interesting opportunity where you go in and, and you say, you know, I'll, I'll even pick on your building here. And you may, you may be fully staffed. I don't know where you are specifically, but, but um, you've got Almond Grove is, um, uh, is is that right? The name of it here in, in Almond Orange Heights. Bay? Almond, Almond, Heights. Heights. Almond Heights is just is maybe three mile, four miles from where I I, I live. Um, your your front desk person there was somebody I go to church with who just recently has stepped into full time retirement, and and so I'm looking at that, I'm thinking so you know could you go in there and make it so like Almond Heights you know how would you go about making Almond Heights the the cool place to live so that you would not, you know, it might be that everybody else out there had had um, had had struggles with staff, but you're the cool place to work. And and so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So, well, again, there's there's no magic formula to it. Unfortunately, it's it's, it's just 
it's grinding it out. It's, it's hard work. And it, it, it goes back to what we started with. It goes back to our culture and, and making, making it a better place for them to where they feel that they're heard, that they're respected, that, that, that they matter and that their opinion matters to us. And, and it does. And so um, I think that's just, and again, that's, that's more intangible, but you have to figure out ways to make yeah. that important because again, everybody out there, you know, so if we offer a dollar more, somebody's going to offer a dollar 50 more. And it just, it just, where does that end? If we keep with that kind of bidding war, if you will. So we have to do it through more intangible means. We have to do it through respect and dignity and making sure our team members feel good about where they work. Um, it, it does come into some residual benefits. You know, if we can offer better healthcare benefits and those types of things, then those, those uh, factors will play a role as well. But it just comes down to caring for people and, and making it a, a fun place to work too. You know, we believe in kind of the motto of work hard, play hard. I can't, I can't excuse the work that we do and, and, uh, or, or, or make it easier per se because the work is the work. And when you're caring for residents, it's very hands-on, like I said, but it's making sure that they know that we, we're there for them, we support them, and that we're going to let them have some fun along the way as well. So one of the things that I, I think one of the great opportunities for senior living is to do for leaders to do a great job of vision casting, of helping people see the vision of the organization so that they realize that they're not, you know, they're not just cleaning floors. They're not just um, uh, serving meals. They're actually making a difference in the world. And I've kind of have a sense that you guys are really and that you as a leader are really good at, at sort of casting that vision. Can you talk to me a little bit just about how you think about your vision and how you go about conveying that vision to your team? Yeah, again, it's it's a lot of communication. You know, we we host a quarterly um, cultural orientation, what we call Camp MBK, for all new department managers that that get hired on with us. So within their first quarter of hire, they they um, participate in this uh, orientation session, so we can help you know continue to spread our mission and spread our vision with them. Um, we do. Uh, you know, daily stand up at our communities, which virtually everybody does, but we also do stand up at our home office and we share the good stories coming out of our communities. And we, we send out kudos to all of our buildings for the things that they do and the letters that we receive. So we share those messages of all the good things that are happening and make sure that they know that we're seeing it, we're hearing it, we're appreciating them, and then we'll send them little kudos in response. So it just comes back to that personal touch. It comes back to those phone calls. It comes back to, you know, part of technology and part of the pandemic was calls like this, you know, virtual calls or, or, or um, video calls and things like that. And while I think there's video fatigue for everybody, and Christy can allude to that for, for me because I always give her a hard time about putting it on camera. But, um, you know, the thing of it is it's helped us reach team members from afar and that that process will continue. So um, there, there's there's good that has come out of the pandemic, believe it or not, as well. Well, I would I, I I'm kind of with you on the video thing. I we do a team meeting every every Friday morning, and and we've got a couple of new writers who joined us today. And people sometimes don't want to turn on their cameras, and I'm kind of I want those cameras on because I want to see those smiling faces. <laughs> I want to see people how people are reacting. So I, so I'm with you. There's a there's a, 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 a leadership guru by the name of Adam Grant, and he talks a lot about how uh, camera fatigue and how terrible it makes people. And he thinks people ought to make cameras more optional. And and I maybe he's right on it, but I kind of think that maybe he's got some personal bias in there. And that's that's why he's pushing. That's why he's really, really pushing that way. So I'm going to try putting you on the spot here. I'm a little nervous to do this. because I've done this with other leaders and I don't know, but I'm thinking it'll be OK. So you talk about the storytelling. Do you have a story you can tell us? Um, a story about, uh, now you about a, resident about a, team, a resident or a team member. Well, yeah. So recently we had our annual leadership retreat. And um, at, when we do that each year, we always try to um, bring in a resident or a family member from a local community. So we, our, our, our retreat was held in Huntington Beach. We actually brought in a um, family member of a memory care resident that we have in one of our buildings in San Diego. And um, she shared the story of you know, her process of trying to figure out a place for her mom to move into during the pandemic. And she had actually spent many hours and visits at a competitor and, and was on the verge of moving the, her, moving her mom into a, one of our competitors and ultimately met with one of our sales directors 
um, Connie DeLoves at our uh, Montero building in San Diego. And, and um, Connie did such an amazing job of, again, kind of spreading our mission and selling our vision, if you will. It's not just for our team members, it's for our residents and families as well. And that time that she spent with Connie, our sales director, won her over, so to speak. And she's moved, she moved her mom in and it, during a very challenging time, obviously. And um, she, she, she was in tears, but tears of joy for the support that her mom is getting and for uh, the, the burden that we lifted off or our community lifted off of her shoulders. And again, it's a, it's a common story amongst the industry, but it was just it, it, literally the entire room, 150 people were in tears listening to her and her story. And, and, you know, it was great to hear the support that her mom is getting, but it was, it was what was most important to her was that she gave, we gave her, you know, in her words, the ability to have her mom back and have the time with her mom, rather than being a, a caregiver, she was able to be a daughter again. And so tremendous story. Um, you know, I, can't say enough about the executive director and the sales director of that building, what they've done to win people over and just a very heartfelt story. I, 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 you know, you just, you're warming my heart when you tell that story. I, I just, I believe, I believe that if we were more purposeful in the industry about collecting and telling those stories to our, to our team members, I'll start here. With, if we, were, we were more effective about telling those team member those stories to our team members uh, about how we're actually making a difference in people's lives. I think people would feel more appreciated. They'd love coming to work. I think that that, that working in senior living would be seen as being a lot cooler. And and I believe that telling those stories to prospects is the most powerful way we can really. Um, we can make people really fall in love with with what senior living does because you and I both know that for many many people older people uh, senior living represents the best possible way to live out those last chapters in their lives. Right, right. Um, and I think video messaging again part of the technology we we've, we've adapted over the the last year and a half video messaging to prospects and and being able to for them to kind of see what's going on in the community to see the life and energy of the community, even if they can't visit at a particular time, or if, if they've got an out of state family member that they want to share this experience with um, it's really helped our cause along the way. Yeah. And I just, I just think that, you know, I mean, we have this beautiful, these beautiful devices we can use to collect stories so easily. One of the things um, is you're probably aware I'm just, because I know Christy was there up just back from the smash conference and one of the, the speakers talked about how, you know, marketing needs to be more human to human and storytelling, which, and so that's really storytelling basis. And so I'm just thinking that you bring out your, you know, when somebody starts to tell a story about you, if you can just bring out your phone and have them tell the story to your, to your phone, I actually did some of that. People would come up and say, oh, you know, I love what you're reading. I said, can I do that with my phone? And people were actually surprisingly willing to, to let you capture those stories and use those stories. And so um, I, I just really love that. Okay, so you I don't, you look like you're about 35 or 40. Um, so you've got a few years to go before you're ready for senior <laughs> living, right? Yeah, so I wish. <laughs> tell me, here's my question for you. Tell me about the senior living community you want to live in when you get to be 85 or 90. You know, I, I think to me, it's a it's a senior living that provides choice that that allows you to, again, have variety of choice, whether it's meals, activities. If you want to spend a day in your room, you can spend a day in your room and not be bothered, so to speak. That would probably be more me. And, and you know, my salesperson is going to be the one that's out there floating around those communities, you know, yeah. the entire time interacting. But um, but it's just it's a community that provides choice, but it's a community that has a lot of energy, a lot of life. And, and when all is said and done, that the caregivers and the team members and the residents really have a good uh, social relationship and, and they're more, almost more friends than they are, you know, worker and resident type thing. So um, to me, it's just, uh, it's a community that you just walk in and you can just feel it. And, and it just makes you feel that, that sense of life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, it's such an intangible thing, right? But you walk into some communities and you go, oh man, this just feels like home. And you walk into other communities and you go, I want to get out of here as <laughs> fast as I can. 
the the thing I wonder a lot about is is we we have so much discussion about what baby boomers are going to want in senior living, uh, but there's a part of me, and I'm just curious what your thoughts on this. The part of me that thinks that when we get to be 85 or maybe 95, because we're sort of extending life, that maybe what we really want is going to be not that much difference than what people want today, because at that point, care and family and meals become sort of more, maybe a higher pro- probability. So just curious what your thoughts. I may be completely wrong, and so I'm just curious. No, I, I think you're spot on. I think that the, the needs don't really change. It's just, it's feeling good about where you are. I mean, if, if you're, if, if we have just myself, like you alluded to, if I'm living at home by myself or with my you know immediate family, and, and now I have to have a need to be in a senior living community, you want to still be able to, to have that same family time, to, save, to have that same social time with your friends, uh, to be able to come and go it, 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 at least as much as you're able um, and enjoy not only things within the community, but things in the outside community as well. So I don't think our needs really change. It's just it really comes down to physical abilities and, and just staying, yeah. um, staying social and staying mentally healthy more than anything. Jeff, we're about out of time here. I want to say thank you very much for joining me. Um, just kind of a program note for next week. Next week's going to be really interesting and unusual in a couple of respects. At Argentum, a few weeks ago, there was a guy by the name of James Ree, who's one of the two keynote, uh, keynote speakers. And he gave one of the best, most powerful uh, keynotes I have ever heard. And he really talked about how you can lead from the heart. So very much what you're talking about here, Jeff, the way you lead. And so I reached out to him to see if he would come on Foresight TV. He agreed to do so. And so we're actually going to do this as a joint production with Argentum uh, since they were a big part of this. And what's really cool about it is we're going to go for a full hour. And and, uh, James Ball, the James Ree and I will talk for 20, maybe 30 minutes. And then we're actually going to open it up to you, the audience. And if you want to come in and make a comment, or uh, ask a question of James, or I guess if you want to talk, ask me or, or James Baldy, you can do that too, but he's really the focus. And so I really would encourage you to do that. We'll publish a link where you can go in and, and join us. And um, I think it'll be pretty cool and pretty special. And, you know, we try experiments like this and maybe it'll blow up, but I don't think so. <laughs> but Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you for thank you for changing the world of civ- senior living, for making it a better place for teams and, and residents. And um, uh, appreciate your being on. Thanks so much, Steve. It's been an honor to be here. I really appreciate it.